The Gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. Listen once again to the word of the Lord. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and he went into the house and his disciples approached him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, Let anyone with ears listen. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Salem, 1692. A story most of us know the contours of already. Little girls, the daughter and niece of the pastor, start experiencing convulsions and terrors, and the contagion spreads. People claim to experience phantom touches, unexplained injuries, visions of their neighbors coming to attack them. Witchcraft is blamed. People name their friends, their enemies, their family members, and in the span of about 15 months, 20 people are killed, another five die in prison, 120 others are jailed, and 200 are accused, about 10% of the area population. A few years back, I visited Salem with some friends during October, and when you go during October, Salem is a Halloween carnival. We saw the Rebecca Nurse Homestead, and the memorial and the museum, but most of what was going on was rides, cotton candy, witchy shops, and pointy hats. Now, it's kitschy fun, and humans need fun, and if you have had fun there, I am not judging your moral compass. But my feeling that whole weekend was that I was standing in the middle of a holy place, a place where God's people had tried to take matters into their own hands, a place in which sin in God's church had killed, and the spiritual heaviness of that reality remains. God's judgment remains. An abuse of human rights that struck at the heart of a community, not just a town, but a church. Fear and misogyny, racism, classism, superstition, rolled into spiritual abuse 
and eventually mass murder by the government. What's going on there now is a category error. This was real. Historians obviously are interested in what caused this, why these symptoms all at once in all these different people. Some say boredom, vendetta, people maliciously coming after their neighbors. Some say the girls felt stifled and they wanted to exert power. One of the theories, which is not proven, but is pretty well regarded in the literature, is poisoning by a fungus called ergot, which most commonly affects rye. The weed in our parable here, Zizanian in Greek, is pretty much universally acknowledged to be a type of rye called darnel, also called poison ryegrass. And darnel is infected pretty often with ergot, but more commonly it's infected with a fungus called Neotyphodium occultans. There will be a quiz after the sermon. This fungus mimics ergot. It's endophytic, meaning that it lives inside the seed. Genetic studies suggest that this was true in Jesus' time and place as well. For thousands of years, people have thought that darnel itself was toxic. There are lots of allusions to darnel poisoning in literature of the time, and the symptoms are what you would expect from either one of these fungi. They both secrete neurotoxins, and if you eat enough, infected darnel can kill you. In the Middle Ages, they called it bread poisoning, and outbreaks of sickness from infected bread, but people also used it to get high, or to add to their beer to give it an extra kick. So we'll come back to the poison, but let's turn for a moment to another important point here. How do people manage to accidentally eat poison grain? Well, as we saw in the children's lesson, darnel looks so much like wheat that it's very hard to tell the difference, especially if you're dealing with seeds or with immature plants. At harvest, it takes a lot of time and attention to get all of those plants out. Darnel is all over literature as a metaphor for trickery and subversion. If you look close, you will find it in King Lear's Crown of Weeds. Try and uproot the darnel, and you'll certainly catch some of the wheat. And what's more, its roots snake around underground and ensnare other plants. So you may end up bringing up a plant that you aren't even pulling. This is why, in the early church and in the Reformation, this text was often preached in support of religious liberty. In 1525, Martin Luther said that the church's religious violence was a double murder, you both kill the body and you steal the person's opportunity to encounter the gospel. Now, I sincerely hope that all of you came to church this morning already opposed to killing heretics. But that does not mean that we're not given to the habit of rooting out wrong think in our communities. In these cases, wheat and weed might be less serious than saved and not saved, and it might mean people we don't want to fellowship with. We have book bannings, we have prohibitions on teaching things like critical race theory, but we also have campaigns on Twitter against people who question orthodoxies, the removal of college professors who step out of line. Both sides of the aisle chase people out of the town square, out of respectable society. In a church, it is easy to set up barriers to full communion with one another, barriers that interrupt the difficult peace that God has called us to. I grew up being taught that women could not preach or teach or serve as elders and that we are supposed to obey our husbands. I know that there is someone in this denomination, perhaps in this congregation, who thinks that I should not be ordained, and I find it offensive. Like the servants, I can point out the wheat and the weed, that they look different, that one is right and the other is wrong. But I have not been called to pull up the weed. I have not been called to remove God's child from fellowship, and we all have something like this. 
a point at which we would like to eject someone who is too far to the right or too far to the left of us. Today, the gospel says to us, no. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. I don't actually know the heart of the person who I think is simply being unreasonable, and they don't know mine. From their perspective, I am the weed. So I invite you to think about who this is for you. Who might be a weed in something smaller than eternal salvation, whom God is calling you not to uproot. When we celebrate the sacrament in a few minutes, I encourage you all to pray for that person as you partake, to extend the peace of Christ in your heart. Now, there are certain points at which in taking on responsibility, you give up some of the lenience that you're entitled to, and what I'm thinking about is pastors. If I got up here and preached heresy opposed to the consensus creeds of the church, you would be within your rights to have me examined by higher authorities and perhaps removed from the pulpit. I have a responsibility to you and to God that rests on privilege and trust. No one has a right to preach. But that is a very different thing from chasing out members of the church who believe differently from you. And it extends to other areas of our lives as well. Whatever happened in Salem, one of the toxins there was groupthink. Groupthink can kill. Let's turn away from less serious differences and back to a different side of the text, the toxicity of the weed. The parable says that the devil has planted seeds and evil is growing alongside good in the world. And the servants ask a question that we ask too. Where did the weeds come from? Where did evil come from? Why is it allowed to continue to grow? Darnel is a more successful plant than wheat. It dominates the nutrients in the soil. And only the mature plant, the fruit of the plant, really makes it obvious that darnel is different from wheat. It feels, often, that following the way of the weeds, the way of the devil, will make you more successful in the soil. That you'll grow, you will thrive and dominate and if you steal and exploit and kill. And in this world where evil is not uprooted, this is often simply true. And it almost feels sometimes that God cannot tell the difference between good and evil, that God is rewarding the darnel with the riches of the soil while the wheat suffers and struggles, hungry and weak. But of course, this is not true. The unjust flourishing of the weeds is due to exploitation to theft and to sin, and not to divine favor. The evil comes not from God, but from attacks on the world. And God is interested both in protecting the wheat and in allowing the weeds time to repent. It would be nice at this point to say with many interpreters that this parable is about the human soul. It's an easier story to swallow that we all have good and evil within us. And while that is true, it is not what the text says. And so we have to wrestle and deal with what is on the page. There are children of the enemy and children of the kingdom. Darnell doesn't grow well in the wild. Its survival strategy is to hide in the wheat harvest and make it back into the barn to be replanted next year. It would be a cruel God who allowed this to happen, who allowed evil to continue forever. We know this intuitively, but we come to the question that tortures the modern and the postmodern mind. What about the eternal fate of the weeds? Second Peter says that God does not wish for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is not the only verse in the Bible that suggests that we have hope for the salvation of all people. 
And that idea comes from the Old and New Testaments and from different writers. But there is also no way to make it through the Gospels without the warning of eternal judgment. When we come to the Bible, we have often to deal with these troubling uncertainties. Seeming contradictions as the word of God speaks to us in words that we can understand. It is better called a dialectic than a contradiction, and the difference is this. We hold two truths in tension, allow them to confront and negate one another, and seek the deeper truth that undergirds them both. Texts of judgment and texts of mercy speak to us at the same time with the same word of God, and we are asked to hold them both. Mercy cannot exist without judgment, and judgment cannot exist without mercy. It is a harder way to read, but it leaves room for the victory of God and the trust of his people. Where we arrive is that the church has no authority to claim that all people will be saved. We don't know. But we do have the authority to pray for the salvation of all the wheat and all the weeds. Verse 41 says that causes of sin will be rooted out. This is the word scandalon, stumbling block. And in a few chapters, Jesus will use it to describe Peter, the rock on whom the church is built. No one is beyond God's mercy, and praise be to God, it is not within human power to determine who gets it. The sower who scatters this good seed identifies himself as the son of man. Jesus uses this title for himself in the Gospels, and it really has three major meanings. The first is that Jesus is a human being. The second is to call attention to Jesus' mission to suffer and die. Thirdly, it harkens back to the Old Testament, to the book of Daniel in which the Son of Man will judge the world. The end of our text today is also an allusion to Daniel, who says that those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament. It is a terrible thing to contemplate the judgment of God. But what this means is that the judge is the sower, the one who planted the field with his own hands and is carefully cultivating its growth, protecting its roots. The original hearers of this text would probably not have known that the poison weeds are actually infected with something else. But the Spirit speaks to the church today, and the scripture is rich, living, and active. And so I don't think it's wrong to point out that the evil is not a created attribute of these weeds. They are sick. Christ came not for the healthy, but for the sick. Not for the righteous, but for sinners. He came to suffer and die on behalf of his creation. He came, as I have said here in this pulpit many times, joining God in covenant faithfulness irrevocably and forever to humanity. God made a choice never to leave us, and there is no going back. Why? because the second person of the Trinity is now also a human being. God created us, wheat and darnel, for union with himself. And it's the Gospel of Matthew out of all the Gospels that is seeking to hit us over the head with this truth. The Gospel begins with Jesus' name, Emmanuel, God with us. And it ends with Jesus' promise, Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is who he is, God with us, God for us, the God who saves. Come and be healed. Amen.